Hello, my KMO students. So this lecture is for 23rd July Thursday, since eCampus is going to be out for the next four days. So I went ahead and carried this lecture. It will be I on the Blackboard Collaborate Ultra Recordings by 5 p.m. today. All right. Today means like it'll be there by 5 p.m. on 22nd July. And then uh, if you do not have time to view it by midnight tonight, what you can do is you can go ahead and download this video. Keep that in mind. Go ahead and download this video so you'll have access to all the videos. So all the videos from this week, you'll be able to download them through Blackboard Collaborate Ultra. Keep that in mind. All right, so without further ado, let me open up the slides for this week. We're going to get started. All right, so last thing that I talked about is this concept of like we talked about the different factors that affect the entropy, right? We talked about four factors. There's the substance, the temperature of the substance, and then the type and the number of particles that make up the substance. And then definitely if you have a pure substance versus mixture or how does mixing affect the entropy. And we worked through some Alex problem to answer those questions. And then we talked about the second law of thermodynamics, right? How the delta S of the universe, the change in entropy of the universe, when it is greater than zero, then we said that that change is spontaneous, right? So this part right here, right? But the way we define delta S universe or the change in entropy for the universe equals the sum of the change of entropy of the system plus the things in entropy of the surrounding. And we work through an Alex problem to kind of have a sense of how do we answer that, all right? And then I talked about the third law of thermodynamics, how at absolute zero, which is the zero Kelvin or negative 273.215 degrees Celsius, the entropy of a crystal substance is zero. Right. And then we worked through some problems as to how we can find the delta S degree of a reaction by subtracting the standard entropy of the product minus standard entropy of the reactants. Right. So we worked through this problem by using this formula. Right. So I worked through this problem where I subtracted the standard entropy of the product minus reactant, and then I got my answer. So this was the last slide I went through. Now, I'm gonna finish the remaining of the slides. I have about 22 of them. So the remaining of the slides, what it focuses is on something called Gibbs free energy. All right, so we're gonna look at how the Gibbs energy or Gibbs free energy the as in goat affects the spontaneity of a reaction or the spontaneity of a chain that we're interested in. All right, so first, uh, before I define what free energy is, what we've learned is the second law of thermodynamics, which states that the delta S universe, which is the sum of delta S of the system plus delta S of the surrounding, if it's greater than zero, then we said that it is a spontaneous process, right? So this right there, when the last universe is greater than zero, we said that that is a spontaneous process and that is what the second law of thermodynamics tells us, all right? So, but the issue, if you think about this, right, is basically, that means if I do not know the delta S of surrounding or the entropy change in the surrounding, I cannot figure out the delta S of universe. If I cannot figure out delta S of universe, I cannot determine whether that 
since it's spontaneous or not. All right, so that means it would be really helpful if we have a function, chromodynamic function that focuses on just the system, right, and not the surrounding, and then predict the spontaneity of that reaction. And this is where the free energy comes into play. First, let's define the term free energy. The free energy is denoted by Z. So anytime someone says free energy or gives free energy, these two are the same thing, right? So that means you've learned two terms. H was enthalpy that you learned in K115. First, you can just tell, see whether amount of heat absorbed or released by a reaction. S was the entropy, and in layman's term, entropy is basically how ordered or disordered a system is. And finally, G tells you about the free energy. Now, what is free energy? It is basically what how what the name says. The energy that's free. That's it. All right. Now, the way to define, but then what does it even mean when the energy is free? Is uh, the way to think about this in layman's term is basically the maximum amount of energy that is available to do work. All right, so again, I'm going to repeat the maximum amount of energy, or if you want to call it free energy or internal energy, whatever you want to call it, available to do work that is called the Gibbs free energy. All right. Now, similar to how we have been talking about the change in entropy, change in enthalpy, we can talk about the change in Gibbs energy as well. Right, and then good thing about this all this thermodynamic function is we can relate by this formula, and it's called Gibbs formula or Gibbs Helmholtz equation. All right, delta G equals to delta H minus T delta S, and that T, not surprisingly, is the temperature, and that T is usually or always measured in Kelvin. All right, so that means if I know the delta G of the system, I can predict spontaneity of the reaction. And that's why this thermodynamic function is very important. All right. Now, remember how we had talked about as to how delta S of universe, when it's greater than zero, it's a spontaneous process. When it's equals to zero, the process is at equilibrium. And when delta S of universe is greater than zero, it's a non-spontaneous process. We can do the same thing with the delta G system as well. So anytime you just see delta Z, because remember, this is just referring to the system itself. Just chemists do not include that term system. So you can just forget about this term. Anytime you see delta Z, that is referred to the system. Keep that in mind, all right? Now, how does the sign of delta G tell us whether a process is spontaneous or not? That's it. All right, now if you look at this, that is a little different from delta S of universe, right? For delta S of universe, when it was greater than zero, then it was spontaneous. Keep that in mind. And when delta S universe was less than zero, that was a non-spontaneous process. For delta G, it's just the opposite. When delta G is less than zero, then we say the reaction is spontaneous. One thing to keep in mind, all right, is make sure you understand whatever I mean by in the forward direction. So think about this. You have a reaction. We have a reactant going to product. Now this right here is going to reactant to product. That's always called the forward direction. If you try to go from product back to the reactant, this is called the reverse direction. That means if the delta Z is zero, sorry, not zero. If the delta Z has a negative value, which is the same as delta Z, or change in Gibbs energy being less than zero, the reaction is spontaneous in the forward direction, right? Which is opposite to what we've been talking about in delta S universe. So make sure you keep that in mind. And then when delta G is greater than zero, the reaction is 
non-spontaneous in the forward direction. And remember, when the reaction is non-spontaneous in the forward direction, it has to be spontaneous in the reverse direction. Keep that in mind. Spontaneous in the reverse direction. And even this one, right? If a reaction is spontaneous in the forward direction, it means it's non-spontaneous in the reverse direction. And similar to how we are defined as delta S universe when it's equals to zero, the system is at equilibrium. Same thing over here. When delta G equals to zero, the system is at equilibrium. Here, now let's take 11. All I ask is how does the sign of delta G help with the spontaneity of reaction? Hopefully, whatever I talked about in this slide will help you answer the question on knowledge check 11. All right, so now, the relations between delta G, all right, if you look at this, the signs, mathematical sign, whether it's positive or negative, effect whether delta G is negative or positive, all right? So all these, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to show you in this and this slide, right, whatever this talked about, right? Now, the way we're going to do it is basically, remember, delta H can be negative, can have a negative value or a positive value, right? Same thing with delta S, can have a negative value. as well as a positive value, all right? So now we're gonna talk about four scenarios here. Now this is definitely really important from exam three point of view. You're definitely gonna get, going to get your either one or two questions based on this concept. There are four scenarios that I'm gonna talk about. Let me put the plus plus sign a little bit below this. Draw a line. Post post sign. All right. So why am I doing this? What's this? So first thing to keep in mind, make sure you look at this equation and think about what I'm saying mathematically. All right. All right. So remember, first thing is remember that temperature T is in Kelvin, right? That means temperature can never be below zero Kelvin. Because third law of thermodynamics told us that zero Kelvin is the smallest possible temperature, right? That's why it's called absolute value. Right, that means temperature T is never a negative value in that equation. Right, the first thing that we're going to see is the first scenario when delta S is negative and then delta S is positive. And this is my first scenario. Right, so when that happens, right, let's say my formula was delta G not let's say my formula is. Now let's think about this mathematically, all right? Now when delta H is negative, this value right here is going to be have a negative number, right? And then minus temperature, like I told you, is never going to be a negative number. Temperature is going to be a positive number. This is going to be a positive number times delta S we're looking at when delta S is positive, right? That means my delta G is going to be negative, positive times positive is positive, times negative is negative. Negative added to negative will give me a negative value. I hope this is making sense, all right? Yes, you can memorize the crap out of this and get points, all right? But then again, I do want you to take like just five minutes to internalize this. All right, take your time to internalize this. 
it'll help you a lot because if you think about other courses that you'll be taking in the future, engineering courses, I don't know, physics courses, you have to deal with these kind of situations, right? Like when it's plus minus minus, this kind of stuff. So make sure you're understanding this. That is no matter what, whenever delta S is negative and delta S is neg positive, delta G is always negative, right? And what did we say earlier, whenever it's always negative, that is less than zero, the reaction is always spontaneous in the forward direction. That means is the reaction spontaneous? Yes. Always yes. Always yes. It is spontaneous. So I hope the first scenario makes sense. Let's look at the second scenario. The second scenario is when delta H is positive and then delta S is negative. All right, so I'm going to go back to my formula. And what he's telling me is basically when delta H is positive, this is going to be a positive term. Minus T is always going to be positive. Don't worry about it, right? Positive times my delta S has been given as negative negative All right so i'm going to put a bracket here so you see the demarcation over here and don't get confused All right so now let's do my math this is positive number this positive times negative is going to be negative negative times negative is going to be a positive number that means positive plus positive is always going to be a positive number that means in that scenario it's always positive and when delta g is positive or when delta g is greater than zero look at that the reaction is non-spontaneous right always no it is not spontaneous in the forward direction since delta g has a positive value <coughs> all right so for the negative and negative there are two scenarios scenario number one Scenario number two. Same thing with positive and positive. Scenario number one. Scenario number two. And you can work it out. I'm just gonna tell you here that whenever it's positive and positive, delta G is gonna be negative. But then at high temperature. Whereas delta G is gonna be positive. at low temperature, right? Whenever it's negative at high temperature, it's a spontaneous process. This positive means it's not a spontaneous process. Same thing with positive, positive. It is positive at high temperature. And then negative at low temperature that means if it's delta g is positive which means it's a non-spontaneous process negative means it's a spontaneous process so make sure you have the table something like this because definitely something like this will definitely be in the exam for sure it's a really really important concept All right so i hope this makes sense as to how we can use the delta z value whether it's a negative or positive number, determine whether it is a spontaneous or a non-spontaneous process. So basically what I wrote down in this slide has also been mentioned in this slide in the same way. All right, so anytime you see the delta H is greater than zero means it's telling you delta H is positive. That's what it means. When delta is less than zero means it is a negative number. All right, so I hope this is making sense. All right, so now let's answer Alex question as to how we can use this table to answer this Alex question. All right. So it's use observations about each chemical reaction in the table below to decide the sign of the reaction enthalpy H. 
and reaction entropy s. That means what they are telling us is you have to determine the signs of delta H and delta S. So think about this as going backward, right? So let's say if you're given the delta G value here, right? If you're given delta G value or the sign of delta G value, then you will have to go backward and figure out the signs of H and delta H, delta H and delta S. All right. So let's get the first scenario. Let's the first scenario reaction it tells me the reaction is always spontaneous. All right. So that means I'm gonna go to my scenarios and I'm gonna figure out when is it always spontaneous. The only time delta G is always negative. Remember, when it's always spontaneous means it's when delta G is always negative. Keep that in mind. Always spontaneous means delta G is always negative, right? Because that's how we are defined negative. All right, then I'm going to figure that out. That means the only time that is always negative, no matter what is my first scenario here. That means for that scenario, delta H is negative, delta S is positive. Delta H is going to be negative, delta S is going to be positive. All right, so now let's go to the second one. The second one is a little bit tricky. So it says now that talking about the reverse of this reaction is always spontaneous. If the reverse of the reaction is always spontaneous, that is, can I say that the forward reaction is always non-spontaneous or not? Forward reaction always non-spontaneous, right? Now, if the forward reaction is always non-spontaneous, means delta G has to be always greater than zero, or delta G always has to have a positive number, a positive sign, right? So I'm going to figure that out. Let me look at my scenarios and see where delta G is always positive, no matter what. Delta G is always positive where? Delta G is always positive in mind. Look at that in my second scenario. Right, because when delta is always positive, means it's a non-spontaneous process in the forward direction. Right, always non-spontaneous in the forward reaction. That means for that scenario, my delta H is going to be positive, my delta S is going to be negative. It's going to be positive, delta S is going to be negative. Now the final one. It says crystallization of a pure compound is spontaneous, okay? Only below negative 31 degrees Celsius. That means think about that at, at low temperature. It is spontaneous, right? But at high temperature, it is non spontaneous. I hope you understand how I wrote this out because remember it, the thing told me that crystallization of that pure compound is spontaneous only below that temperature right that's why i said at low temperature it is spontaneous but above this 31 degree celsius at high t it is non-spontaneous all right so i'm going to go back to my table and find out where are these two conditions where at low t it's spontaneous at low t it's spontaneous Meaning, I let me write that the sign of delta G as well. If the spontaneous means delta G equals to negative at high T, is non spontaneous means delta G is positive. So at low T, delta G is negative. At low T, delta G is negative. At low T, look at this delta G, remember this my delta G column is negative. And then at high T, delta G is positive. At high T, delta G is positive. And that tells me for that to happen, both by delta H and delta S has to be positive. Right. Again, this is, I understand, is a very abstract concept. Take your time, make sure you understand 
I to analyze at the first two parts. This should be a little, little easy to see for you. All right, the first two, sorry, not the third one. All right, the where the delta H and S are both negative and where delta H and delta S are both positive, it is a little bit tricky, but then make sure you know how to use this table when you're answering that RX question. All right, so hopefully, all right, so now, Something that we talked about, right, as to when delta z equals to zero, we said it is in equilibrium. That means using this equation, delta z equals to delta h minus t delta s, what we can find is something called the equilibrium temperature. The way to find that out was because remember for equilibrium delta g equals to zero so i can write down zero equals to delta h minus t delta s i'm going to add plus t delta s to both sides of the equation that means i'm going to get t delta s plus equals to the negative t delta s and then positive t delta s are going to get cancelled that means my equilibrium temperature t equals to Enthalpy change generated by entropy change. That means if I know the enthalpy change of that reaction, if I know the entropy change of the reaction, guess what? I can figure out the equilibrium temperature. Or the temperature at which the system is at equilibrium. I really want to think about it. Right? All right, so uh, similar to how we had talked about standard entropy, right? Delta S degree, same thing with the delta G degree as well. We have the same concept, right? That means you, we have something called standard free energy change, similar to how we had the standard entropy change. And that remember the standard degree, all it tells you is you are at the standard conditions. And the way we had defined standard conditions earlier is the same here. You have a one molar solution. Your room temperature is 298 Kelvin or which is the same as 25 degrees Celsius. And then finally, the pressure is one bar, which is very close to one ATM. All right, so these are, these are your standard conditions. Make sure you know these conditions. I can definitely ask you in the exam. All right, and then in the standard conditions, not surprisingly, my formula delta Z will have a degree sign for all of those thermodynamic constants. All right, now this is something about PNH into joules versus kilojoules in calculations, and I'm gonna show you in a couple of slides as to how or how we gonna wash these units very closely before we do any calculations. All right, so now let's define similar to how we define delta s degree f right as the standard entropy change for each element we can do the same thing for the standard free energy of formation right so the way we're going to define this is going to be very very similar to how we define delta h degree f in km 115. i want to make sure you if i give you this definition you are able to write down the standard free energy of formation chemical equation similar to what i have asked you in km 115. the way we're going to define that is the standard free energy of formation delta S G degree F for a compound like or liquid water is defined as the free energy change for the formation of one mole. Do you see in the product there is only one mole of water? Right? From its elements in the standard state. Look at that. Hydrogen is in its elemental form 
and it is in a standard state, meaning that it's a gas in its standard state, not solid or anything else. All right. And then oxygen is a diatomic molecule. That's why O2. All right. And then something that you should have noticed is like there's a half oxygen on it. The question of half is there because remember, my goal was to form one mole of liquid water. So after I write this equation out, right, this right here, whatever value I get is called the standard free energy of formation of water liquid. All right, so similar to how we had used delta H degree F to calculate the delta H degree of reaction, how we had used earlier delta S degree F to calculate the delta S degree of reaction, we can do the same thing as well. We can use delta G degree F values to calculate the delta G degree, the standard free energy change of the reaction as well. And the formula is the same. If you're given these values of the product, right, minus the reactants, and making sure you include the coefficients in there as well. That means if your coefficient was the x in the product, you have to include that. If it's y, you have to include that as well, and so on. All right. And again, I am going fast here because this concept is very similar to the concept that I talked about for this. It's really for this, which I talked about in the earlier lecture today. Okay, now, a couple of things to keep in mind. So the way we have defined delta S degree of formation for any element in its most stable form is zero, and that's true for even delta G degree of formation equals to zero. Well, that's gonna come in very handy whenever we calculate the delta G degree of the reaction similar to this, right? So Alex is gonna ask you this, it'll give you the um, data tab. Uh, sorry, I have to turn my stove off. <laughs> All right, so it's asking us to calculate the reaction, standard reaction free energy, so delta G degree of the reaction, of the following reaction. And all I'm going to do is use the delta G degree F of the reactant and the products, and then I'm going to calculate the delta G degree of the reaction. All right, so my formula for delta G degree, First, I'm going to write down the values that's in my LH data tab. So for sugar, C6H12O6, which is in solid form, it's delta H degree, delta G degree, F values is given as negative 910.4 kilojoules per mole. Keep that in mind. Whenever they give me the value of standard reaction entropy change value earlier delta s degree of formation the unit was in joules not in kilojoules that's what they mean by anything to joules and kilojoules in your calculations right, so this unit is in kilojoules right. then i'm going to look at my reactants if you look at my reactants right this is in its carbon elemental state most standard form because it's in solid hydrogen diatomic molecule in its standard state oxygen in its standard state as well and all of these are gas at room temperature right that tells me for all of these carbon hydrogen 
and oxygen, the value of delta G degree F is going to be zero. Where did I get that from? From this. We define that as zero because they are the element in their most stable form and at standard conditions. And this makes my life way easy. With my formula to find delta G degree for the reaction is going to be summation of number of moles of the product and then the free energy standard reaction free energy of the formation of the products minus summation of and number of moles of my reactants standard free energy formation of the reactants this is my product all right but the good thing about this part is made my life easy because all of these are going to summed up to give me zero right because there is values are zero for the reactants that's my sum of the product is going to be one mole for my sugar and then the g degree f value is negative 910.4 kilojoules per mole right so i'm done with my this part minus i know that all of these are going to end up zero right because if you do the math it's going to look like six times let's look at carbon right the delta g degree let me show you the delta g degree formation for carbon is given as zero and i can do one but then everything is zero here that means the only thing that's left is this part that's why my answer is minus 910.4 kilojoules all right now something to keep in mind this one right here is there is one mole of the sugar that's why one mole meaning that this mole and mole gets cancelled my final limit has to be in kilojoules not kilojoules per mole when i find the change in free energy of the reaction all right now two or three more concepts and i'll be done with week four so bear with me all right so basically all the delta g that i've talked about all right has been under the standard condition this degree again is the free energy change under standard conditions which is one molar concentration 298 kelvin or room temperature 25 degrees celsius and one bar which is pretty equivalent to one atm pressure all right so now but then there is an equation that lets you calculate the delta g under any other non-standard conditions right? that means delta g can be calculated if you know delta g degree value which is under the standard conditions and then if you know that i is the gas constant t is the temperature in kelvin and this q right here basically is the same q that we used in our equilibrium chapter all right reaction quotient and we'll work through a problem as to how we're gonna calculate the value of q so it'll be more like a review for you all right and something else you should have noticed is this r value is going to be this which is the same as 8.314 loose per mole kelvin right because all they did here was change this kilo joules to kilo joules to get that number all right all right so we kind of connected this delta g with the reaction quotient right but then we said that that reaction quotient is also related to q or the equilibrium constant k as well all right so now what does that tell me is basically you can even use that equilibrium constant k to determine whether that reaction is going to be spontaneous or not all right so how does this work is basically the way we said is whenever delta g is less than zero or whenever this is negative 
we said the reaction is spontaneous, right? But if we want to use the equilibrium constant K, when K is greater than one, not zero, we say that the reaction is spontaneous. When K is less than one, we say the reaction is non-spontaneous. And whenever I talk about this, I'm talking about spontaneity and non-spontaneity in the forward direction. Keep that in mind. Meaning that whenever K is greater than one, right here means it is product favored. That's why it's spontaneous. Again, lots of abstract concepts that I'm throwing out there. Take your time to internalize this, please. All right, so this is how it works as to the reason between delta G at standard condition and then equilibrium constant K, right? Because what we said was, when we talk about K, we talk about K whenever the system is at equilibrium, then only we can use K, right? Otherwise, we cannot talk about equilibrium constant. But what did we say earlier was whenever the system is at equilibrium, the delta G value is zero, right? That means my this equation becomes delta G becomes zero, delta G degree becomes delta G degree doesn't change plus RT, and this Q at equilibrium becomes the equilibrium constant K, right? That means we got that. We can relate the change in free energy under standard condition the g degree with the equilibrium constant for that reaction all right and the rt is the same gas constant and the t is the temperature all right so let's try to work through this problem as to how we can calculate the reaction free energy the delta g degree under the non-standard condition. That means delta G in the non-standard condition. So anytime someone asks you to calculate the delta G under non-standard conditions, the first formula that should come to your mind is basically, oh, delta G under non-standard condition is equals to delta G under standard conditions plus RT ln Q, All right? So to solve this problem, which has asked me to calculate the reaction free energy under non-standard condition, standard condition, what I'm going to do is first thing is I'm going to first find delta G degree, right? Find the delta G degree under the standard condition. Basically, I'm finding this first in my first step. Then the second step, I already know my R constant. I know my temperature is this. I have to change that to Kelvin, and then my the second step, I'm going to calculate Q value based on these concentrations that have been given to me. All right, so since I need lots of space, I'm gonna... Use my whiteboard. All right, so what I said was, First thing that I said was, I'm gonna first find my delta G degree for the reaction. For the delta G degree reaction, if I know my number of moles of the product, and then the delta G degree at for the free energy change, formation for the products. If I know for the reactants, I can solve my delta G degree F. All right, so first I'm gonna go to my LX data tab and then see what values do I get. All right, so the values that I find under that is for AL3 plus this aqueous form, this value is given to me as negative 485 kilojoules per mole. For my other product, which is hydroxide anion, this aqueous form, its value has been given to me as 157.2 negative kilojoules per mole. And finally, for my aluminum hydroxide, which is my reactant, the value of delta is G degree F, given to me as 
0.25 kilojoule per mole. All I have to do is use this formula to figure out the delta G degree of the reaction. So it goes to, let's focus on the, let's focus on the product part first. Right? For my product, I have aluminum three plus aqueous. There is one mole of it. And its value is negative 485 kilojoules per mole plus the other react product is three moles of hydroxide anion times negative 157.2 kilojoules per mole. Done with my reactant, I'm going to go to my product. Sorry, I'm done with my product. I'm going to go to my reactant side now, right? To my reactant side. My reactant side, I have only one reactant side, and there is only one mole of alum aluminum hydroxide. That's why one times negative 1147.25. Right? So if I do my math, the, the GDV value will come to. 190.65 the beauty is going to be kilojoules because the more moles are going to get cancelled right then this is going to be a final unit so i'm done my first step second step i'm i've asked you to calculate the q reaction quotient and it's the same way you've been doing right for my second step to calculate my q i'm going to look at my reaction and it's going to be the, the concentration of L3 plus times the concentration of OH minus raised to the power three because I have three moles of this divided by, oh no, this is a solid, means solid do not show up in the equilibrium expression, right? Or the reaction quotient expression. That means my Q value, I can write that as concentration of AL3 plus times the concentration of OH minus raised to the power three because there are three moles of OH minus. That means all I do is put in the value and the good thing is I have been given the concentration of that. Look at this, it's at 0.485 molar aluminum three plus and 0 0.580 molar hydroxide. Both of them has, have been given to me. That means all I do is plug in the values. This is 0 0.485 times 0 0.580 but raised to the power three then my map, I'm going to end up with 0 0.094629. That's the value of Q. All right. That means now all I have to do is go back to my original formula. And I said that my formula right here is basically delta G equals to delta G degree plus RT ln Q. All I do is now plug in the value. All right. So my delta G equals to the G degree, which I called it as 190.65 kilojoules plus RT LNQ. R value is 8.314. But then remember that is in joules. All right. So I'm just going to go ahead and save my time and I'm going to directly convert that to joules or use the kilojoules right here. See how this is in kilojoules. So I'm just going to directly use that unit. All right. And the reason I'm changing that to kilojoules is because this part right here is in kilojoules. All right, that's why I'm going to change that to 0 0.008314 kilojoules, right? 8314 kilojoules. So R, so let me write that from right here. So it's delta Z to delta Z degree plus RT ln Q. Right, plus I is there. Temperature that has been given to me is what's the temperature? Where are the temperature is at 25 degrees Celsius. So if I send that to Kelvin, remember you have to convert that to Kelvin, that will be 298 Kelvin. Done with R, done with T, Ln of Q means Ln of 0 0.094629. Now, if I do all my math, my final delta G is going to be 184.81 kilojoules. Again, lots of steps, but again, one at a time. 
All right, so your first step should be, oh, I'm going to use my free energy formation values to calculate the delta G degree of the reaction. And my next step, I'm going to use the concentration of the products and the reactants to find my value of Q. And after that, it's simple math. Let's plug in, in that equation. All right, that's how we calculate the reaction free energy under non standard conditions. Delta Z. All right, so now there are three or four more slides left, and we're done with this chapter. All right, so now remember, we talked about capital K equilibrium constant, we talked about even within K. All right, we have KC whenever equilibrium constant is talked in terms of concentration. We had Kp whenever equilibrium concentration is talked in terms of pressure. The Ka, that's the acid dissociation constant or acid ionization constant. Kb is the base dissociation constant. Kw is the water ionization constant. Ksp is the equilibrium constant whenever you have the solubility product, right? Kf and Kd, we haven't talked about it, so forget about that. But then the other ones that I talked about can be used for this K values. Right? So basically, the delta G degree, the standard free energy change, can be related to the value of K. And basically, remember that K is literally, if you want to tell somebody what does K means, right? That Ka, Kc, Kp, Kb, all these capital Ks, what do they tell you? They do not tell you anything but extent of a reaction. That's it. All right. So basically, is it react in favor or is it product favored or are they at equilibrium? Is what all these capital K tells you, right? All right. So now two more slides and we'll be done. So this is similar to using this formula because remember what we said was at equilibrium delta G equals to zero. When that happens, my formula can be derived, right? Where it tells me the standard free energy change of the reaction and how it relates to the equilibrium constant, right? So this question asks you that. So it asks you the equilibrium constant K. All right. So I can calculate K if I can calculate the delta G degree of the reaction. And then I can find the delta G degree of the reaction if I know the delta G degree formation of all these reactants and products, right? The delta G degree formula tells me it's equal to sum of the number of moles of the products and the delta G degree formation of the products minus delta reactant, delta GDV formation of the reactants. All right, so without further ado, if I look up the values of the delta G degree F on Alex, what you're gonna see is if it's hydrogen means it's in pure standard form, this will have a value of zero. If it's iron solid, this would have a value of zero. That means all I have to do is find the delta G degree of value for water and then iron three oxide. All right, so that means my delta G degree is gonna be three times the delta G degree F of water minus my reactant one time the delta G degree F of F of two O three. And if I look up the values, I'm gonna get three times for the water, the delta G degree F is gonna be negative 237.1 kilojoules per mole. The mole and mole get canceled. And minus one times G degree F for iron oxide is negative seven foot 2.2 kilojoules per mole. Mole and mole gets canceled you will get the answer 30.90 units again in kilojoules. 
small k and joules. Right now, I'm going to plug that in my formula where everything is known. That is 30.90 will equals to minus our value is 0 0.008314 and the reason i'm doing that is basically this is in kilojoules so that this unit is also going to be in kilojoules my temperature value is given to me as what at 25 degrees celsius that is the same as 298 kelvin and i must change it to kelvin because this unit has kelvin in it and finally ln of k Right, so if I solve for ln of k, my ln of k will equal to negative 12.46. Since there is a negative sign here, that means my k value is going to be e to the power negative 12.46. If I do my math, I'm going to end up with 3.9 times 10 to the power minus 6. All right, so that means the equilibrium constant tells me it's 3.9 times 10 to the power minus 6. That tells me, oh, this is definitely not product favor, right? Because since k is such a small number, even less than 10 to the power minus 3, means this is definitely a reactant favored. All right, that means the extent of the reaction, if you want to think about this, is reactant favored, not product favored. Now, the last problem, all right, is kind of based on this concept, this formula that I used. Right, this formula and then this formula. So what what I've asked you is calculate the KSP. It's the same thing. If you need to ask the calculate KSP, it's the same as you calculate the equilibrium of constant K. All right, but it's more like solubility stuff. That's why KSP is given, and it's asking for PBCl2 at 25 degrees Celsius. The first thing to make your life easy, I'm going to write down the equation. Remember, this is the knowledge equation. To make your life easy, since it's talking about the KSP for PBCl2, when it dissolves in water, it dissociates into Pb2 plus aqueous plus 2Cl minus aqueous. All right. Now, after this, it's the same thing. All right. I'm going to find the delta G degree by using the delta G degree formation that has been given to me here in Kluzus per mole. Right, product minus reactant, and you'll get the value here. And then I'm gonna use the delta G degree equals to minus RT ln of KSP and solve the same way I solved this part. What's the unit for R? Right, so this is it. So, whatever I have taught you in week four until right now until the second is what will show up in your exam three right so week four material all everything i taught you in week four material will show up in exam three